So um, I will start. We have uh, usually like three hours with a break of 15 minutes in between, so 90 minutes um, class, then uh, 15 minutes break, and again 90 minutes for eight weeks. And uh, in this class, I'm, uh, we are going to talk about Japanese animation as part of um, Japanese, um, what's it, Japanese popular culture. Um, so I, I was actually thinking of uh, talking, uh, I had two possibilities. One was to talk about Japanese animation, and one was uh, to talk about or to hold this class about uh, J Japanese popular music. But I've decided on, on animation um, because on one hand is more, uh, it allows for more, uh, um, um, rather many, um, for, for a multi-layered interpretation of um, Japanese society, particularly in, um, in post-war post era. And on the other hand, is a more, it, um, it is more um, of a, is more representative uh, for this um, flow or flows, cultural flows occurring between Japan and uh, the global world in more, uh, so in, in modern times, so particularly since mid 19th, 19th century. Uh, so this is one hand, and secondly, Japanese popular music is not, is not um, of such high quality um, most of the time. It sounds like, well, most of the time, not always, but mostly, it's like kind of bad cover of Western pop music. So, and it's not, it doesn't really follow the, the global trends. So I prefer, I, I choose Japanese animation, and particularly post-Cold War animation. This means since the 90s. But before diving into uh, the content, the proper contents of this class, um, I'd like to talk about schedule, the term schedule, and then the requirements of, of this class. So this is a schedule, and the first, um, like today, I'm going, I'm going to talk in a kind of introductory uh, lecture about Japanese animation and um, what, what exactly Japanese animation means in the context of Japanese popular culture. Um, both, um, and we're going to try to, to try together. So I have prepared the materials, but it would be good if we can come up with a definition of Japanese animation. Then um, I'll talk about today. Today and next week, I'm going to talk about history and systematics of Japanese of what we what is defined or what is understood, what is comprehended um, within this very large uh, c concept. So history is, is, is quite simple. Systematics refers the characteris to the characteristics uh, and, uh, and categories of Japanese animation. And then um, the rankings as well as um, um, popular or famous anime, anime or animation directors. Um, in two weeks, so and then I will, or this class will uh, have a thematic structure. This means I have choo chosen three animation works, Metropolis, Tokyo Godfathers, and Mary and the Witch's Flower, which we are going to watch together. There's a reason uh, for that, because uh, you, you'll have to write three essays on each of these animation movies. I'm going to talk about them, of course, and explain um, what I see, how, or my, my, my interpretation of this animation works and why exactly I believe them to be representative for post-Cold post War or late modern um, well, um, media culture. So in the first one, uh, Metropolis, I was, um, I was thinking, I was hesitating between Metropolis and uh, Firebird, um, the Cosmozone of Love. But on one hand, uh, the Firebird, the Cosmozone of Love, was released in 1981, so it's, it, it, it's, the, um, it's outside of the time frame I have decided, so since the 90s. So m both Metropolis and Firebird are based on Tezuka Osamu, or on, on manga, manga works by Tezuka Osamu, who is, who is, who is considered the, the father or the grounder of Japanese. Uh, manga, so comics and um, 
uh, who's, uh, um, and had uh, um, a very powerful impact on the emergence and development of animation. And I have chosen Metropolis because on one hand it, it, um, it draws on the movie Metropolis from 1927, from, it's a German movie by uh, Fritz Lang, and it deals with uh, artificial intelligence, which is a very, well, burning topic uh, right now, and the relationship between so, robots, humans, and on the very important concept of love and what exactly we define love and we, when we refer to artificial intelligence. Um, so it is important because so Tezuka Osamu is, is famous for having brought into the world of, of popular culture, such as manga and animation, um, very deep, very profound philosophical topics. And love is one of them. And so, um, so love is, is conceptualized, as we're going to see in the movie itself, as a concept not, not as a romantic love, but uh, a sort of complex friendship um, notion, which combines um, both empathy and integrity, so compassion, and this um, level of self-awareness, which allows us to not to duplicate ourselves when we think of in artificial intelligence, but to to, 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 um, to dream of some sort of, Übermensch would say in German, so super, superhuman, which is essentially transcends uh, human essence. The second topic, the second theme I thought is important is compassion and acceptance as, we, as it is displayed or tackled with in Tokyo Godfathers from 2003 by um, anime directors Kon Satoshi. Uh, this is his th uh, third movie, his third movie, uh, and is um, very, it's important because it deals with um, outcasts of Japanese society. Uh, as you'll see, some the main characters are not regular citizens of the Japanese, so it, it happened, it, it, um, it is, the plot is situated in uh, present day Japan, uh, Tokyo, and uh, the main characters are homeless people. And the whole storyline moves around these homeless people and um, the, the way they live their lives and why exactly, and the fact that homelessness is not necessarily um, a hindrance in having, well, um, a life full of, uh, well, not, not joy, I wouldn't say joy, but anyway, a life worth living. Um, and the third movie I have chosen is um, Marianne, which is a flower, by um, um, Yonebayashi Hiromasa. Who, uh, this is a young director. He's born in 1973. He, this is his last movie. Um, so he, the, his last, he, he had created, he had directed three movies so far. The first two movies, um, The Secret World of Arieti and Memories of Mani, um, have been produced and released by Studio Ghibli. And um, afterwards, they have um, decided, so he has decided, together with another, colleague from Studio Ghibli to create a new anime, animation studio, Studio, studio Ponok, and Mary and the Witch's Flower is his, or the first release by this new founded studio. So what's important about this movie is, it is this is a fantasy movie which rehashes the topic of shoujo, or more clearly of maho shoujo, which is this this uh, magical girl genre, a very prolific one in post-war post anime world. Um, but uh, Yonebayashi does it in a very sensitive way. So we do not ha it's, it is not a uh, rep uh, repetition of, um, well, Miyazaki Hayao's uh, Kiki's Delivery Service from 1989, um, but rather uh, this is one is, is based on a, on a British uh, children's novel from 20th century, and um, refers to this um, to the concepts 
of to the concept of individualism and how one, one is supposed to create his or her own identity uh, based on, um, of, on responsibility and this rela uh, relating to other people uh, via friendship. So the concept of individualism and freedom is directly related to responsibility and friendship. Then, uh, by mid-November, um, we're going to have individual presentations. I'm going to, to explain afterwards a little bit more in detail. Oh, these are the, I forgot, these are the handouts. Please take one, each of you. Individual presentations, uh, each of, each of uh, with last 30 minutes, I'm going to explain afterwards more in detail about the two requirements of this course. Then some more discussions and then uh, the last class, then um, conclusion, conclusion and submission of essays and term paper. So the evaluation of this class, the requirements of this for this class are as follows. An individual presentation with 20%, uh, three small essays, each of has 10%, Metropolis, and you're going to write on Metropolis, Tokyo Godfathers, and Mary and the Witch's Flower, and a term paper on individual topic, 50%. So the deadline is the last class of this course, and um, you have to submit them as hard copies, so not uh, digital copies, because I have to keep them as hard copies for five years um, in, in, in my office as, as a proof that you have submitted them. So the presentation, as I said, is 30 minutes, so, and within the 30 minutes, 20 minutes your own presentation, and 10 minutes discussion. Um, so topic, you, you, you have to choose your own topic. It's not uh, like, um, and preferably uh, should be the same topic as the term paper, the final term paper. Um, because during the discussion after your presentation, you can uh, usually new ideas or corrections come up and you can build them into your final paper. So the, what I would like, I, uh, I'm not going to be too, um, um, intrusive about this one, but please be very careful in the bibliography. If you, usually you, at the end of the presentation, you have a couple of, of, of works you have, um, you have quoted or cited. Um, please know Wikipedia. I know everybody's using it, but uh, do not put it in, um, in the bibliography. Um, and um, what, what I'm looking for, what I would like to, to hear in this presentation is not so much um, like general information, but rather how your own, uh, how, how you individually, personally relate to the topic. So it's very important to, to use your, your uh, like critical thinking, this is something you are supposed to, to learn um, or should be a byproduct of, of university um, education, um, and, but also your own creati creativity. So it, don't, like, try to choose a topic which, is, which represents you, which you can identify with and which you, you actually like. So three small essays, um, again, um, I'm, I'm going to, to talk a little bit about each of these anima animation work. Um, and what, what I expect from your mini essays, so small essays, is your point of view. So not, do not try to write down what you think I might want to hear, and it will be, like during, the, during this course, it will become quite clear what is my position towards um, Japanese animation and towards various diverse um, directors or animation works themselves, um, but write your own um, opinion and what you think about it, why you like or you do not like what you see. Um, for instance, you can also, uh, so based on this animation works, works you can 
imagine the future of animation? Huh? And why do you think it, it, it goes in one way or, or another? Another point of view would be the con co uh, crisis of contents, which we are facing since uh, early to mid 2000s, and it is increasing. It, do we really have a crisis of content? So, like, uh, endless repetition of uh, previous topics, as Hollywood actually does have, or is it simply um, that the, the world is moving faster than before, and by living increasingly in, in a hyper-connected world and being, um, being permanently exposed to waves of information, we, simply, we have to learn first how to cope with this information. So it's very important to, to, to see or to watch animation as a sort of cultural medium which is, it is produced within the context of, and with the tools, with the instruments of, um, of the entertainment industry and serving cultural consumption. But on the other hand, um, it, it reflects this um, thirst, I would say, or this striving for significance, for commitment, and for um, emotional connection be, uh, between or among individuals. And um, the final paper should be in academic style, so the essays can be written in a more like freestyle, but the academic term paper should be written in academic style. Please um, use uh, so Chicago manual as general orientation. So you have there all the information. I'm not going to get into this, but what is very important and for the mini essays as well is that you write the class term, your name, because if you don't write your name, I, I get um, papers without names constantly in all classes. So you have to write your name and your uh, student number. This is also very important. So write name, student number. Um, please attach a title to your papers and to your essays. And don't start with the with a, with a text itself, suddenly. So I, I appreciate titles. And then um, page numbers. So I know, I, I, I would like to say a little bit more, a couple of more words about why I have been thinking about these requirements. Uh, I know from, from um, corresponding research that um, so presentations, oral presentations are very unpopular. So um, students do not like to talk in front of their classmates on a topic they have chosen by themselves. I know it is very unpopular, and I know um, most of, like, uh, I, like, um, it is criticized due to the, like, as, as a, as a remain, remain, remainer, as a, as a shadow of this frontal teaching between teachers, uh, so frontal teaching, so teachers on one side, students on the other side. I believe oral presentations within, within the context, with the framework, framework of, of um, university classes are very important because this is the only way you can prepare for, for instance, for job interviews, mm? where you have to talk about a topic you have prepared uh, beforehand and then be able to answer questions and face uh, criticism, for instance. Um, in life, in I always say that college, university, is not uh, an extension of childhood or adolescence, but rather, or should be, a preparation for real life. And in real life, any job you'll apply for, you'll have a job interview. So, and as far as I'm concerned, the only way you can, you can prepare, or you can learn how to talk in front of other people, how to talk directly to other people in a very official context is within the classroom by, by having or by holding oral presentations. And believe me, compared to an oral presentation in front of a actually benevolent teacher and your classmates is nothing compared to um, a job interview. So oral presentation is very important. 
uh, as a preparation for real life. Then um, small essays are I think are important to develop fle uh, flexible thinking and critical thinking so that you hear one opinion, my, in this, my, my opinion in this case, on a specific topic, and then you have to develop going from, uh, go based on that opinion or moving against it. So again, it's, it's a way to, of learning and practicing what I call flexible thinking and critical thinking, uh, which is actually, as I said, a byproduct of academic education. And actually shouldn't be a topic in itself, it's, it's a byproduct. Um, and by writing small essays, this is again a, is, is necessary as a necessary practice in in respecting specific uh, clear frameworks and and um, working within uh, them. And the term paper is a preparation for a graduation thesis. Like you have to start if you do not start now by writing smaller essays, smaller papers, it will be impossible for you to write a big, like a, a, a fair, a fair and a, um, an honest graduation thesis in two and a half years. So it all is, I'm, 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 I'm trying to, um, to construct this class, this course as a sort of constructive, or as a sort of progressive preparation for, um, in the light of um, in light of uh, your graduation. Um, are there any questions? It's clear. So when you choose your, your topic of your paper, uh, of your presentation and of your topic, so it, it might be that you have, like, you don't, you don't really know. Um, you cannot decide. Of course, I, I, I will listen. You can come and ask me, and I'll, I'll, I, we're going to find the solution. Uh, but Please come f first think by yourself, come up with some suggestions. Don't ask me, uh, don't come to me and ask me, I don't know what to write about, please tell me. So I'm not going to give you so solutions, but work with your suggestions and um, find a solution which fits your, um, your intention. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I, I, I can help you. But first, uh, you have to come up with, um, with your individual suggestions. Um, are there any questions or comments? No? OK. So for this course, I base my, so, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm using this, these three papers, uh, these three books. For uh, when I talk about so uh, when I talk about Japanese animation, as I said, the, the, the focus, the main, the main, um, the, at the center of this class is actually post Cold War animation. So since the nineties, but in order to understand what exactly um, this post Cold War or uh, an animation is. Um, I think it's necessary to, ex to give a brief overview of what general animation since its emergence actually means. And for this class, I, have, I use these three books. Um, the first one, which I think I, I use as a foundation as the most important, is my own book from 10 years ago. Unfortunately, I cannot recommend it to you because it's, it's written in German. Back then, I, I was trying to um, to make a career in Germany, so I was publishing in German, um, and lots of lots of um, notions and concepts. That's why it, it was very difficult to to try to translate the whole the whole concept and the whole history. Anyway, so I use it as a foundation, and then this is this book, Anime: A History, which has appeared um, five six years ago. Um, it's so due to the fact that this book was written 10 years ago, it's not so updated anymore. And also the, the, um, in this past, last 10 years, the anime, animation, Japanese animation industry has moved, has been moving quite fast as usual. Um, so this, this one is, um, so the problem with this book's dealing with animation is that they don't really work ethnographically. What do I mean? So 
And this is what, uh, one point which um, I um, would expect from your papers as well and your presentations as well. It's very important when we deal with Japanese animation and generally speaking, Japanese culture and Japanese civilization to, um, to, re to, to start with eth ethnographic work. Ethnographic work is, means if you decide to write, to, to, to deal with a topic, doesn't matter which topic, you have to see that thing. There are lots of um, researchers uh, and, yeah, researchers, both um, Japanese and Western, who are talking or um, research, uh, analyzing phenomena they do not really um, experience by themselves. This means, and it is very obvious, at least from my perspective, when someone talks about something without actually having seen that thing. This means when you, you're going to write, let's say, about an animation work, an animation, I, I don't know, what, what do you, let's say, Princess Mononoke, right? Please watch the movie first. Don't, don't just come and have a presentation um, on something you haven't seen by using uh, secondary literature. And this is the problem with this kind of, of books. They are very analytical and uh, to a certain degree quite profoundly, um, profoundly analytical. However, they do not really deal with ethnographic analysis. So they do not go in the depth of the animation work itself. So it's obvious that the person who has written this book um, has a lot of knowledge of Japan, Japanese animation, and generally speaking of animation, of the animation industry, for instance, the Western ones, or as, such as um, Walt Disney. But they haven't seen most of the animation works they talk about. This, like, um, I'm, I'm coming from, uh, so my major research method is field work, uh, which means ethnographic work, which means seeing the things and experiencing firsthand, experiencing what they call phenomenological experience. So experiencing the phenomena I'm talking about by myself. And this is, I would like you to do the same. No, it doesn't, um, regardless of what, what, um, what your topic for presentation and for a paper is, um, it is vital that you see the things you are talking about. And this is the major problem with this, with this book. And this one, this is a very, um, it's, very it's called Anime Encyclopedia, um, a century of Japanese animation. And it, it includes all animation works, movies, uh, series, and OVAs, OVAs, so original video animation, um, uh, released by the Japanese and animation industry since uh, 1917, when the first anim animation work was released, so the first official Japanese animation work was released. So this one is, uh, well, this is very informative and obviously very ethnographic, that's why I like it. Um, but um, sometimes it's, very inc it's quite inconsistent. This means um, depending on, on animation work discussed or detailed, some of them are very, are very, um, finely or sensitively explained, and as some of them are quite superficially um, analyzed. Um, but as, as a foundation, as a starting point, this as to the um, technical details of every animation work ever produced in Japan, this, uh, this book is very, is very, is very practical. Um, so these are the three books I am using in, in this course. Um, and um, no, um, and this is the, the overview of how I, I see Japan, the Japanese animation as an object of academic research. So let's starting with a definition. So this is very important. Anytime we talk about something, we have to define what we are talking about so that we are clear on, on, um, it's on what we're talking about. So how would you define 
Japanese animation. So, entertained. So, what's the, what's the, what's the difference to um, Walt Disney animation? Um, most of So this is um, rather from like aesthetic point of view. So when we talk about uh, this cultural phenomena, there are two levels of analysis. One is aesthetic, so the medium itself, so how it looks like, what you have talked about. And then we have the second, le second level, which is what I would call ideology, so the contents. So from a contents perspective, how, what, what, what do you think makes up Japanese animation? Yes? Uh, Japanese animation seems very personable. And it shows a lot of Japanese culture within their animation that you can immediately reference when you're actually within the culture, as opposed to Eastern animation, which is more drawn towards younger generations, children, it seems. So the culture representation is <coughs> So, yeah, so, um, like, traditionally speaking, we would say Western animation was rather oriented or targeted at children, like children's, children's books as well. Um, whereas West, uh, uh, Japanese animation is targeted as, at, at, uh, like, grown-ups, yeah. audiences as well. Yeah. So why do you think is this so? Is this so? But, like, try to find the reason. Or does anybody know? Uh, can you can you imagine why is it so? Why Japanese animation is has de developed in the direction of targeting grown-ups as well? Well, I don't have an answer either. So, and <laughs> so, and um, speci specialists are arguing as to why. That's why I'm, I'm asking as to why this is happening or this has been happening because originally, so it's, it has always been like this since uh, 1917 when the first animation work was was released. So in pre-war pre-war Japan, uh, since 1945. There was um, propaganda animation. It was obviously targeted as gr at grown-ups to motivate them for war and to motivate them to believe in the supremacy of the Japanese ethos and so on. So, and um, even so, it was obviously targeted as at a at a grown-up, at mature audience. And um, um, well, researchers, specialists are still arguing as to why this is happening. Why exactly um, compared or uh, well, compared to Western animation, and we're talking now about American animation, mostly because European animation, particularly East European animation, for instance, Russian animation, Czech, Czech, Czechoslovakian or Czech animation, French animation as well, these are, these are big schools most like, um, and they're rather avant-garde schools, huh? um, schools of animation or fashions of animations. But when we talk, when we talk about entertaining animation, so 
the animation which sells, we refer mostly to uh, US America, so, and essentially to Walt Disney <laughs> or Pixar. Uh, even uh, though also Pixar is, uh, or Marvel, huh? they are also, they are quite rather um, entertainment animation, so produced within the entertainment industry and um, coordin or coordinated by this um, um, or being um, being compared to respect the rules of the entertainment industry, while while in, um, in so European animation uh, European animation schools um, also in, in in the northern countries there is um, like Finnish animation in the Finnish animation school uh, they are very they are. They are not so mainstream medium, um, and they are often used as um, as avant-gardist media to to um, to see how audiences react to new or unusual ways of representing reality. Hmm? Because animation, comp in co again, co compare in, in relation or. Uh, on, from from a media medium perspective, compared to live action movies, is more plastic. Has a more uh, is more. Um, on one hand, creates this distance to audiences because it's not not real life uh, representation. On the other hand, is is more plastic in its ability to 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 um, idolize, idolize beautify reality, to offer a more. Uh, Aesthetic, beautified, or more idealized version of reality. And this is one of the. That's why, for instance, if you think of *Grave of the Fireflies*, have you seen the movie? Yeah. So *Grave of the Fireflies*. Um, there is the book, and the, mo the animation work, and then we have the, the, there is a live-action movie. The, the book is not so like book is just is, is a memoirs is a. Is kind of um, diary written by a man whose sister died in the war, Nosaka Kiyuki. And then the live action movie, if you watch it, is not so impressive. It's just another war, uh, war drama. It's, but that, the, the, the animation movie is just heartbreaking, is daunting, it breaks you. And it, the, the question, like, um, the question arises, why is it so? Why anim the animation version of the same topic is much more powerful, emotionally speaking, than the um, live action movie or than the book? Usually it's, it's the other way around. Usually, the book, if you think of, a, of an organization, for instance, I don't know, probably you have an uh, Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. This is one, uh, it's one of the most famous, most Profound uh, novels of British literature. The novel itself is is is, is a masterpiece. If you watch any version of the movies or uh, any movie versions of the of the book, is superficial. Think of Harry Potter. Oh, okay, Let, let's go to think of Harry Potter uh, movies. Uh, the books I have I have read all of them because my daughter is a fan of it, and I I just saw it last year. So it's very everything is very fresh. So the books themselves are very. Um, you, I don't know if you like it or not. I liked it, the books. So they go in deeply into the psychology of the of the um, of the adolescent children, adolescent um, characters, and they explain this. And then in the movies, the movies are mu much more superficial. They cannot go that deeply. Even if, for instance, they, they made out of the last movie, last book, two movies, huh? um, so that they can capture the depth of the novel. Even if it's actually an entertainment novel, it's not, again, you cannot compare to um, uh, Oliver Twist for, uh, or to any other work of so-called world literature, but still. And the, the usually it's the other way around. Usually the movie is, has, even if it's a high quality movie with a deep impact on audiences, the, it's, it's, um, its value is lower than the original book. But in, in uh, Grave of the Fireflies is the other way around. And why? Because so 
uh, um, the way Takata, so the director of uh, Grave of the Fireflies, explains it is because uh, on one hand, we expect this, or as audiences, audiences expect this uh, distance, emotional, mental distance in terms when we deal with animation movie, uh, animation as a medium. It's not live action. On the other hand, it was late 80s, when, so before Tarantino and before the wild 90s when, when um, special effects actually um, bloomed. Huh? Uh, so uh, late 80s, um, so, um, so Grave of the Fireflies and then Akira, they dealt with reality and representation of reality in a way in which live action movies couldn't do back then. And in this way, they had to, to transform reality and to um, display it in a way which transcended individual imagination or individual um, relating to, to, to that reality. So the representation actually, be, the representation, it, it wasn't a representation of reality as in live action movies, but rather it became a reality in itself by means of um, animation as a medium. So it moved beyond the, the representation um, the, the representation of reality, it became reality itself. And uh, this is, for instance, in the 90s, um, animation directors, more than Western directors, animation directors um, um, worked more deeply with this, or expanded this um, recreation of reality and, um, well, um, penetrating into the depth of, of human emotions, of human imagination, um, like Neon Genesis Evangelion from mid 90s and then um, in 2000, for instance, this psych psychological animation works where Kon Satoshi, for instance, in Paprika, it's his last movie before, before he died in Paprika, where he, he blurs the level between um, the, 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 the boundaries between dream insanity and reality, sanity, and uh, what, what exactly is reality. And we have other animation works which deal with the, the same problematic of transcending reality and becoming them, creating themselves a new way of coping with that reality. So one, uh, what makes animation, what, what, what one, one, Lev one, one, or several, uh, an element which makes animation so, so special is this playful handling, tackling of reality, where it doesn't simply represent it, but moves beyond it and becomes reality itself. And this is part of, of um, it's, mo um, it's, it's more than plain, full, play uh, it's more than plain, pure entertainment and rather becomes um, like um, part of the world culture. Um, and this, um, and w one of the reasons why this is happening is because of the history of animation. So Western animation as I said the first animation work appeared in 1917. But um, we can talk about a prehistory of animation. So what, ha what, what happened before animation itself, so these moving images, so animation comes from the, or anime com uh, com comes from a Latin word animare, which means to give life to So animare means um, to give life, to, to, to make something without life, to, to, to make it a living being. Anima means in Latin 
soul, or and it is often used in psychology as that being beyond our physical appearance, huh? something like beyond what we are. So it, it's, this is so let, Latin words, um, and they moved, uh, m like they were taken over by, for instance, um, Latin rooted languages of um, such as Italian, French, and then um, imported by English as well. So in, um, but if you think from a visual perspective, um, animation draws on, so Japanese animation draws on a history of visual representation of, of the movement, of movement. So, of, so it is a bi-dimensional representation of um, four-dimensionality or multi-dimensionality of life. And um, first, um, f first um, attempts to represent this multi-dimensionality of life via or through bi-dimensional images uh, was in Emakimono. So these are uh, scroll um, rolls from Heian period, so um, particularly 11, 11th and 12th century. And um, the, so this is one, one element where this, the, when, where the dynamics then of, of life is captured in um, static images. After, I'm going to show you some, some images and then explain with, um, with pictures themselves. Uh, so emakimono is one source and then ukiyo-e, uh, literally translated as um, images of the floating world from um, Edo period, so 17th, 18th, and the first half of 19th century. And these uh, ukiyo-e were woodblock prints, color woodblock prints, uh, which served various um, functions of, like, for instance, postcards or um, also as sort of newspapers or um, so materials to, um, to distribute information. So ukiyo-e from Edo period, Ekma kimonos and for, uh, are from uh, Heian period and um, ukiyo-e from Edo period. So Heian period, so this is so-called classical Japan from mid 10th century until the end of 12th century and ukiyo-e are from Edo period from, um, uh, which lasted from 1603 until uh, 1868 when Japan started uh, modernizing. And I'm going to show you some pictures of this, or some examples of this um, uh, Emma Kimono and uh, Ukiyo-e. And then we're going to see the difference to Western um, So for whatever, for whatever reasons I, start, I, I took it backwards, but uh, so this is, this is one, of the, one of the most famous um, ukiyo-e, so this um, color woodblock print. So the printing um, technique, the printing process, printing procedure is quite complicated. So the, um, imagine like, you know, the way they used to print newspapers. So they had um, two block, wood, wood blocks and they would print on like black and white huh, newspapers. Not, not nowadays they do it digitally, but before they, before they did it digitally, they had these um, mechanical uh, printing machines. And uh, it was always like white paper and black uh, letters, is how they printed newspapers. And it, it's the same principle here, but they do it with colors. As I, um, when I was a student, a graduate student, I participated in a ukiyo-e, so woodblock print, uh, printing workshop. It's, it's very complicated. It looks not so complicated, but imagine that every color is actually a different uh, woodblock, a different woodblock with a different color. So they have uh, dark blue here for one woodblock, and then they have one paper, one piece of paper, and um, they, they, they uh, print, they use them, uh, wood block, print, printing wood block for blue. And then they use the one for yellow. 
for the uh, sailor's ship, fisherman's ship, fisherman's ship here. And then they use one for yellow, and then they use one for white, and then for dark blue, and then for uh, light blue. And here, this is very difficult, the, the gradation over there, right? because for every, every different color, you have a different wood block, printing, print wood block, and then um, this gradation is uh, manually um, processed. Um, and then, the, of course, they don't do, like, they have one paper, and then uh, they have several exemplars, several, like, various, um, and they have um, 100, they, they uh, print in blue, and then, one, for instance, 100 in blue, 100 in, then they add the, the yellow color, then they add the dark blue color, and so on. Still, it requires a lot of um, um, versatility in um, juxtaposing all these uh, color levels of colors and in creating the perspective. What's very important in this, in um, Hokusai's ukiyo-e, uh, woodblock prints, so ukiyo-e, is the perspective. So this is one of the most famous, as I said, from this um, uh, 36 views of Mount Fuji. And um, so this is Mount Fuji here. This is, these are huge tsunamis which have, which are over flooding or were submerging the fisherman's boat. But what's very important, so, and this is Fuji over there, what's very important is the perspective of the, of the, of the artist. He's somewhere here. He's somewhere in the middle of the ocean. You have to think about it. It's very, it's very um, unusual back then. Like, he doesn't have an airplane or, or a helicopter or something. He's, and of course, he's not here. He's actually, he's using his own imagination to see things from this perspective. And this is one of the, this is what I was talking, what I'm talking about when, or, uh, when we are talking about animation and this ability of animation directors to transcend reality, to, to see a reality to, or to see beyond the immediate, immediate reality towards a future reality, to create a reality through their, um, their, um, um, their works. Um, we have this, t we have in the West, afterwards we're going to see a um, couple of very famous Western uh, works of art. Um, unless they are fantastic, like um, uh, in, in What's his name? Um, this Dutch painter, Bosch, I think. Unless they are fantastic representations, for instance, of heaven or of paradise or of hell. So fantastic representation of things which exist only in imagination. We do not have this a realistic representation of a reality which cannot exist. Mm? He cannot sit here. Back then, he couldn't. He couldn't have st sit here and painted this um, this um, well this um, catastrophic situation mm? because they are going to die. These fishermen. Mm? They are going to die. And this is exactly what we can see in one picture, which is a very static one and bidimensional. We can see so the tragedy of this fisherman, the wave. Moving, moving their fish, the fish boat, and then um, the water splitting all over uh, the place. And so uh, there are several levels of, of, of um, perspective in one single image uh, created at, in, well, in the first half of the 19th century. It's very advanced. It's very advanced uh, visualization technique compared to what we had Back then, back then, for instance, in Europe, or also in so in the in Western culture, um, which, as I said, moves way beyond the individual momentary perception. This one is like this one is is very impressive due to the finesse of the um, visual construction. As I said, for this graduation. And here, this gradu gra graduation, so colorful, color graduation, is very difficult to obtain by means of uh, mechanical printing. Um, and still, again, what uh, still is um, uh, this, uh, this 
imaginary or descriptive versatility is very impressive for, for that period of time. These are, um, they are called Hokusai Manga, and it is regarded as a sort of like the, the foundation of modern manga. So manga actually means something like sketches, because this is not really a painting, and this is not a printing. These are, these are just sketches. But what's important is the way he captures um, humans' movements. People, are, they are moving all over the place. Like if you, like afterwards, I'm going to show you the um, so Western paintings and see that until late in 19th century, we mostly have static images. They are very static. The, the human body and the human being is uh, treated as a static entity. So as a, it's not lifeless, but it's not dynamic. It doesn't, ha it's not, it doesn't vibrate with uh, some la uh, vital energy. As you see here, it's very, it's like here, the, 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 the relationship between the, so the intensity between the horse and um, the, the person uh, riding, riding it, or the way they play with this. Uh, so you, it's like it's bidimensional. It's very um, plainly drawn, but on the other hand, it, it tries to capture this vibrant um, m moves of, of 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 the human body. And here the same. Uh, so uh, this Hokusai manga. And this is another, this is uh, another very, the second uh, very famous, so um, Hiroshige, and these uh, 53 stations of the Tokaido, um, are also very, very, fa very famous uh, ukiyo-e, these um, images of the floating world. Uh, again, here the perspective is very, is very interesting. He sits somewhere here, like on a cloud or something, and w observes these people crossing, crossing the river. Uh, and this is very unusual, as I said, for, for the period of time. He cannot sit here, actually, because he, 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 he cannot fly, fly, fly in the sky. Um, but the way he, and then again, the finesse of the, of the construction of this, um, of, this, of this scene, and the way he, he tries, he attempts to, to capture the various movements of the people displayed on this picture this is again this is a bi-dimensional picture bi-dimensional representation but uh, multiple um, multiple actions of people involved here the perspective is, uh, again is very is very interesting so here we have humans climbing the the mountain but again he sits somewhere here in the air and this this ability to, to see things from a, from a perspective which um, wasn't available back then. This is what, what we find in modern animation, so particularly in post-war animation, we find it very, very compelling. Huh? So this, this ability to, to see beyond the possible reality and then to, to create that very reality. And, um, So these are um, famous um, um, Joju Jimbutsu Giga. They're very famous um, um, carica caricatures. Um, if you have, if you ever have the opportunity to go to Kozanji in Kyoto, this is a very—it's not beautiful, but it, it's a very small temple um, high in the mountains in Kyoto, in northern Kyoto. And what's here important is the representation of animals. Animals behaving and, well, playing, if you want, as humans. This is very um, unusual compared, and this is from 12th, 13th century. So very unusual from a Western perspective, because this separation between animals or plants 
and humans is very strict in Western societies. But in, in Japan, the way they, they, they um, combine this humanization of animals with a very, very common features is, again, we find it again and again, we find it um, reproduced or employed in animation as well. Think of, think of uh, uh, Pompoko, the Heisei War of the Tanuki from 1994. And okay, um, so in uh, Walt Disney, Walt Disney animation works. They also play with this like talking animals and humanization of the animals. But in Japan, we have this um, hundreds of years earlier. And here the same. Again, so lions represented dynamically in, on, um, in themselves huh, without serving as a background for human life. And these are typical um, emakimono um, from so 12th century, Genji Monogatari, so the tale of Prince Genji. So this is um, so scroll, scroll uh, pictures. Um, they work something like like this. So and then they open like this, and there is the story unfolding. And what's here important is that we have several people doing sev doing several things at the same time. Um, so this this woman, for instance, she's washing uh, something. This woman, she's, I think, brushing her hair. This woman is reading something. This one is uh, cleaning um, um, or playing an instrument. That woman over there is, I think she's, she's um, preparing um, a bird or something for, so for, um, so, so for, to, for, to cook it. So, and then we have the, um, this, the, the background plan where, um, well, presumably people are well, doing things in the, so in the background. So this is like, we have in one picture, actually five different persons doing five different things. And so this simultaneity of actions uh, represented, um, represented in like on the, in, so bidimensionally. This is more like, uh, this is the same also from Genji Monogatari, from the pr uh, uh, tale of Prince Genji. And here we have, again, several, um, l several people doing different actions at the same time. So we have here a chariot and an ox um, <coughs> harvesting. And here, um, this one, I think he's, he's eating. And this one is uh, taking, taking care of an animal. Um, well, this is not very, very clear. They are very old um, scroll paintings. And these ones here, they are working on the field. And then in the background, in the background we have various other people doing, um, going on with their, um, with their common lives. So this ability to represent simultaneously dif um, a, a great var variety of, of um, actions mm, is uh, what makes, what is, I would say, a feature of Japanese visual art, um, so dating back um, in, uh, well, more than 1,000 years ago. So in comparison to it, that was the Western painting. So just, just very, like, very, I've chosen the most, um, the most common one. So Joconda, so she, she's, she's not moving. She's just lifeless. She's just there. She's like, you see this um, very different approach to, to um, representation, to visual representation. This is Michelangelo, by Dave, uh, David by Michelangelo. Again, he's, he's not doing anything. He's just uh, this one too. They're very static. They are um, um, just 
there is no move, movement. There is no, and there is a center, and not so much. There is there, the, it's clear there is a center, and there is a background. And the most important elements are uh, very clearly highlighted, while in the case of Japanese um, visual arts, we had a variety of simultaneous um, and probably equally important, or at least this is how it was suggested, equally important endeavors, human endeavors. Here, this was already changing, so the French Revolution, uh, where, but again, she is in the center, and they are actually highlighting her presence. It's not so much, um, it's again, it's, um, they are, the, the focus is clearly on one, um, here, on one element. This is static, this is, uh, again, we have nature, and it is an object of observation. It doesn't have a life, it doesn't have, um, it doesn't move, it's not, it's, I would say, almost lifeless. This is a very famous, this is a Waterley's, again, so impressionism, where actually the human, human being experiencing nature, this, is, this picture is a reflection of the human emotions when experiencing nature. So actually the observer is the focus, not the observed elements. And, and, and what I have shown you, and so classical visual arts in Japan, actually they represented things, they represented reality is the focus, not so much the one who has created them. So this is, again, this, uh, one of the most powerful um, painting, paintings, works of art of the 20th century, Guernica, so representing war. But again, it's a reflection of the human emotions when contemplating the phenomenon of war rather than the, the war itself. And Dali, mm -hmm. again, so this dissolution of, of what we call humanity or what we call um, structured time or structured um, um, dispersion of, of time. But it's not the element, it's not, um, so the, this, this type of abstract art counts as representation of the human emotions, the human or human mental processes while experiencing reality and not so much, not the reality itself. You understand the difference. This is what, what it is a, the, the fascination we feel when we watch Japanese animation is because the, the storyline, the, the, the fact displayed on screen are in itself a world. While when we, talk, when we deal with uh, Western entertainment products, the, the focus is on audiences rather than on the product itself. So, um, and um, this is what's changing nowadays in Western entertainment products as well, where the product itself must, st or has, has started to contain a message in itself. So this is the, so back to, um, Japanese animation. So this is, um, is it clear so far? Yeah? So then we have, uh, when we talk about, so pre-war animation, the, as I said, the first one, the first animation was produced in 1974. So pre-war animation were exclusively movies. So this means because I, um, TV series were developed since um, early 90, uh, 1960s, when TV, possessing a TV set, became a standard, uh, became part of the, stand of the middle life, middle, middle class family standard. So they're all movies, and the first movie uh, was, um, um, Yeah, 
Imokamuk zo gemban wak. So it was Imokamuk um, zo the port here. So someone who takes care of uh, who who um, who's um, watching, who, like who's taking care of. Um, and we had only five minutes. It was only five minutes long. By and by um, Shimokawa Hekoten, who was 26 years old. And um, it was the first, 1917, the first animation, Japanese animation movie. And um, there were, the, the, in that period of time, there were several movies presented until 1934, um, in which um, anime directors exp experimented with, uh, with several like various topics. Um, but mostly, they inspired either from real life happenings or from um, Japanese legends and um, mythological stories. What, um, what happened afterwards is that um, after Japan well entered or started its military um, development, um, and so 30, 35 to 45 until he lost the war, all movies, all animation movies were actually be turned into propaganda products. And the most um, well famous one is um, Momotaro of, um, so uh, C Momotaro. Oh, uh, Sorano, Sorano Momotaro. Uh, so Momotaro of, uh, so the, um, from uh, of the sky, and um, this one was. Uh, it's a very. Um, we're going to watch a, f a small fragment of it, so you see how how a Japanese animation in the first half of the 19th of the 20th century looked like. So, in spite of the fact that, so in this pre-war history of animation. Um, on one hand, they took over Japanese directors took over um, so developments from Europe. So the first m projections, so m moving projections, was actually uh, produced in um, in France by uh, the brothers Lumiere, which means light. So by, in, in the second half of the 19th century, and then. Um, so in 1927, 1927, the jazz singer in the United States was the first uh, sound movie. So afterwards, uh, up to that point, um, movies were um, um, had had no movies had no sound, and there was so-called benshi, which is a kind of na narrator, and um, who was telling audiences the, um, the storyline, which again draws back to, uh, on to, on to um, classical Japanese arts, such as kabuki and buraku, where um, so there is a storyline, a plot occurring on stage, but then again, and um, someone else is, is, is telling the story. So we have this, and the uh, Japanese directors took over various techniques to, of creating um, images and then employing them in a, um, so as, uh, and then presenting them in, order, in, in such a way to create this illusion of movement. And um, even if, so the, um, in the last decade before 45, so the um, propaganda took over, so contents were actually um, imposed by um, the government and by the military. There were important developments, technical developments, as to what animation and animated movies actually mean. Um, and after, after the war, there was the first 20, so until mid-70s, there was um, there were several attempts to create the um, to create or to 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 this to de de develop to develop um, 
a way to communicate, to develop this animation as a way to develop um, or to, to, to accompany the recovery, uh, the recovery, the recovery works after the war. First of all, so there were um, famous Japanese directors gaining notoriety overseas, such as Kurosawa Akira and um, Ozu Yasujiro. Um, but again, uh, J Japanese cinema and Japanese movies in com taken in comparison to, so the global, cannot talk about global market, but taken, taken uh, so regarded in the framework, in the context of um, so general cinema, c cinema works is very, is, cannot really compete technically speaking. And this has a lot to, a lot to do with, um, again, Japanese tradition of acting and embodying, um, so, um, of, of acting. So when we think of, of kabuki or no traditions where w women were actually represented or embodied or impersonated by men or a bunraku with pup, pup, puppets being, um, being um, um, handled by three puppeteers. So this, there's a diff, there are different traditions to be taken in consideration why Japanese animation developed in itself as, as, um, as a national phenomenon. So at the, until mid 70s, um, first of all, there was Tezuka Osamu, as I said, one, so the, 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 one of the most important, the most important um, comics artist um, so far, and the one who also uh, directed Tetsuano Atomo, so Astro Boy, that's uh, um, in the beginning of the 60s. He um, created a synthesis of Japanese animation, within Japanese animation, as an entertainment med medium with the with potential of expressing and displaying uh, profound contents. Uh, he, again, he, he was very strongly influenced by, by Walt Disney and by Walt Disney's ability to, or Walt, so Walt Disney's um, movies and their ability, in their ability to give life or to humanize elements which otherwise um, are actually, or to, to animate, to, to, to give life to things which are usually perceived as uh, lifeless. Um, he, um, so Tetsuano Atomu, Astro Boy wasn't the first animation series, there was um, another one, and animation series became, turned into the medium to communicate important messages um, to the first post-war generations, uh, generation of children. And this became possible because uh, TV, uh, TV set together with washing machine and, um, that was TV set, washing machine, um, and um, what's the third? These were the three elements which a middle class household was supposed to possess. TV set, uh, no, 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 dishwasher, that, that, uh, that is much later. Uh, washing machine, TV set, and refrigerator. So these three elements, and uh, for, for like intellectual, on an intellectual level, we have the, the encyclopedia, possessing an encyclopedia, so Hei Bonsha, uh, published in post-war, so mid-60s, its first, its first revised, so post-war version, uh, over 20 volumes cost an, a, a fortune, but possessing these elements was what gave uh, Japanese citizens this feeling of belonging to an expanding middle class. Um, and I have heard from Japanese citizens telling me that the, uh, like Tetsuo Natomu is a very like, futuristic um, animation work and um, this concept of, of a cute, friendly robot, again, um, moves way beyond 
the Western imagination of robots as being either slaves for the human beings or as being um, ever. Mm -hmm. So the word robot comes from the slave, uh, from, slab, from Czech word roboto, which, mean, um, which means slave. No? So in Western imagination, ro the robot, a robot is someone who's doing work um, which humans are not supposed to do, so sort of a sla mechanical slave, or is an evil entity which threatens human existence. But in case of, of Tezuka Osamu's imagination or recreation of a robot, that's one um, Astro Boy. Mm? Astro Boy became a symbol of this cute, friendly, um, benevolent robot who serves humanity and, and is able to, to, to create this community with humans. And we'll, we'll, ha we'll find the same topos of friendly artificial intelligence, which doesn't threaten, but rather cooperate and, and questions humanity and what human essence actually means. We'll, ha we'll see, we we'll find this topic in Metropolis from 2001, which we're going to watch together uh, in two weeks. Um, this, uh, and this is very revolutionary. Um, even for, for Japan, this idea of, of a non-human entity, which is part, uh, which becomes part of the public imagine, imagery and public discourse. So we make 15 minutes break. I, I find, I am, I'm looking, I, I'll find a, a small animation fragment I wanted to show you. And so 15 minutes break. <laughs>